So with that said, we're going to be looking today at Mark 12, 13 through 17. I mentioned to you last week, perhaps some of you were here and, and may remember this, that I had had an operation on my left eye. And as a result of that, the doctor who had done the operation had, had put in a lens that actually is working against the prescription that I have. And I have to wait a certain amount of time before I can go and have new lenses prescribed. So it's a little difficult for me, I, you know, to be able to read my notes and to follow and, and flow through, just asking for your patience uh, until I'm able to uh, once again see the, the, the Scripture clearly, because I like to give you the Scripture as it says. And with that said, I'm going to begin reading here in Mark 12. We're going to read verses 13 through 17, and uh, we'll get into our study. Render unto Caesar. So verse 13, Mark writes in chapter 12, they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And so as is my normal way of, of beginning a study, let me introduce you to and remind you of a few things that we've already spoken of in recent studies. We know that Jesus is in the last week of his ministry, and this week and these events are taking place just prior to his crucifixion. His three years of ministry on earth has, has, uh, come, uh, is about to come to an end. Uh, he's going to fulfill the work that he had been sent to perform. We all know the work. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That work that he's doing is a work of redemption. He's come to ransom, to seek and save those who are lost. He's come to voluntarily lay his life down. He's demonstrating his love to the world by doing so. And so Jesus is about to, to complete that, that mission that he has come and he has been faithful to do. And so just that week, after entering into Jerusalem, he had, he had performed quite a bit of ministry. And we saw that. We saw that he had cleansed the temple. We also saw that he had taught and he had healed many. And in doing so, that had provoked the religious leaders to begin to become agitated. The miracles he had performed caused the religious leaders problems. And, and the thing is, is they couldn't deny his miracles. So instead of trying to understand the purpose of those signs and wonders, they simply attributed his works to Satan. They said he does this to Beelzebub. And so they were attributing the works, his miracles, uh, to Satan. And, and for them, that was, that was a simple way to deal with that. They were disturbed by his works, but it was his teaching that provoked them because they knew and they were fearing that Jesus was winning the hearts and the minds of the people. Mark tells us in uh, verse, 11, uh, verse 18 of chapter 11 that the scribes and, and chief priests heard it and, and sought how they might destroy him. It says, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. It wasn't simply the, uh, the miracles that had drawn the attention. What they were really marveling at is the way he communicated the things of the kingdom of God. And, and because of their concern, once again, those leaders had confronted him they questioned him, and they wanted to know the source of his authority. They said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Well, to that question, we saw how Jesus posed one of his own. He had said, uh, was the ministry of John the Baptist, uh, was it from heaven or was it from men? Well, that caused them a great problem, as we saw. They refused to answer. So in response, Jesus refused to answer their questions. And that had led up to him giving a parable to illustrate rebellion, their rebellion against God. And, and we saw that in the parable of the vineyard, he exposed the rejection of Messiah. He also revealed that even as they were rejecting him, God was rejecting them. You see, they had 
willingly refused the truth, and so he left them in their own rejection. Mark simply tells us that after he had done this, they left him and they went away. And though they had left Jesus and gone away, their anger still remained. They desired to bring him down. They continued strategizing how they're going to be able to do that. And because Jesus was a great teacher, well, what they did is, is a kind of, a, it's ingenious in a way. He's a teacher, so they sought to entrap him by his words. If they're going to form an accusation, they need a charge. Now, in Matthew 22, 15 and 16, the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians. So refusing to receive his words, they determined even more to resist. They hardened their hearts, they rejected him, and they rejected his message. You see, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 3, verse 15, it says, as has been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. What was true of Israel during that day is true to this day. There are some who hear the gospel, the message of Christ, his forgiveness, his love, his salvation that is offered, the turning of, of, of a person from sin to turn to him, to be cleansed, to have a new life, to have the power of the Holy Spirit, to be a person who's transformed, to have a new character, to be known by, by purity and love and compassion, things like that. They reject that. They say, no, I don't need that. There are quite a number of people who don't want that. Well, that was true during that day, and yet the word still is true. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Well, they're hardening their hearts. And what's happening is the Pharisees now and Herodians are attempting to catch him in his words. You see, they knew that the more a person would speak, the greater the chance of them sinning. In Proverbs 10, verse 19, it says, when words are many, sin is un unavoidable. You know, we know this today, again, by experience. If you're having a, a disagreement with somebody, the more you say sometimes, the more fuel on the fire you're, you're, you're contributing. And there are times and it's just, it's just wiser for us not to contribute to the argument. Again, it makes it very clear in Scripture, when words are many, sin is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. And so, with this in mind... They're devising a way to catch him in his words. Now, when it speaks of that, when it says in verse 13, they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. The word catch means to capture. It speaks of entrapping or ensnaring. The word that is translated in this passage, catch, is a word that is used very often to speak of trapping a bird. They tried to get him to say something, in other words, that they could turn into an accusation. Now, they're very careful. They're not taking direct, and, uh, direct action against him because they fear the people. So to safeguard themselves, it would be better for them to get Rome to act on their behalf. And so because of that, it says in verse 13, that they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, this is interesting to note, because the Pharisees, you're aware of the Pharisees, you read your Bible, you see the word Pharisee, you find it found in the New Testament quite often, Pharisees. The word Pharisee means a separated one. The Pharisees had an origin in a time of uh, when, when uh, the culture was being influenced by Greeks and the Greek philosophy, and so the Pharisees basically had arisen and they, be, they were basically attempting to keep the purity of the, the law of Moses within the nation of Israel. So at first, these separated ones were doing a great thing, but as you read the New Testament, you see that eventually they got caught in their own legalism. So they were known in the nation of Israel as being very spiritual. They centered most of their activity, when you read the New Testament, most of their activity in Jerusalem because the temple was there. So it was down south. Sometimes they would have people up to the north or send people to the north. Most of their activity was down south. There were about 6,000 or so uh, who would subscribe to the title Pharisee or separated one. And so you see them often in Scripture, and they were known for their outward spirituality. But the Herodians were known for their worldliness. These, these two groups were normally antagonists. 
they're a good example of that statement, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Because what's happening is you have two groups that actually are in opposition joining forces because they hated Jesus. And that hatred for Christ drew them together. Now, Matthew tells us that the Pharisees sent their disciples with the Herodians. That tells us something else as we look at this passage. These disciples were young. They were zealous. They were scholars, and they were trained to be Pharisees. So they were trained to be Pharisees, but they're also being trained to reject Christ. Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 23, 15, and he said it like this. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You travel land and sea to win one proselyte, one convert. And when he has won, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. So what they would do is they would bring in conversions. They would also draw their disciples to think and do as they do. And so they were rejectors. The Pharisees were rejectors of Christ. And so were the disciples that they were training up. Now, in Luke chapter 20, verse 20, Luke gives us more insight into the details of their plan. It says they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and authority of the governor. And so that's what's taking place. They're sending spies who are pretending to be righteous. They're entering in, acting as if they are fear, fearful of God and respectful of him, when in fact they're rejecting him. So that's the Pharisees, but these are also joined to the Herodians. Now, who were they? Herodians were loyal to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the one who killed John the Baptist. And the Herodians had given their allegiance to Rome because Rome is the one granting them power. So the Pharisees were extremely rigid legalists who were devoted to the law of Moses, religious law, but the Herodians were their opposite. They were liberals devoted to the political power of Rome. Now, the Pharisees wanted Jesus killed for religious reasons. They believed that he had violated the Sabbath and he was guilty of blasphemy. When they took him before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate is asking for a charge in John 19, verse 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. That's what they were going after. And ultimately, that was what they wanted to charge Christ with, blasphemy. Well, that's a religious charge. And Rome would not enact capital punishment on such cases. They needed secular charges for Jesus to be executed. And that's where the Herodians became useful because the Pharisees knew that they, that they the Herodians, would report to Rome anything Jesus had said. So if they could bait Jesus to speak against Rome, a charge could be formed. Now, the Pharisees knew that Herod Antipas desired to kill Jesus. In Luke 13, 31, some Pharisees came saying to Jesus, Get out, depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. So Herodians being part of the trap added credibility to the charge. They, can, they believe that they can entrap Jesus in his words. The psalmist said in Psalm 56, verses 5 and 6, all day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps when they lie down in wait for my life. And so he knows that they're twisting his words. Christ is aware of what they're doing. Their thoughts are against him for evil. So they're expecting him to say something. They're waiting to hear his words so they can charge him with something. You know, this attitude, by the way, I'll say this briefly, is, is still with us today. Just because this took place 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that there no longer exist people who listen to catch your, at your word so they can use that against you. We know that that happens quite frequently. It's a daily occurrence in some people's lives. In, in social media today, it's really interesting to me that if you write something and miswrite something, we'll say you missay something, there's going to be 50, 20... Uh, 20, 50, 100, 200, maybe 1,000 or more, depending on how many people are, are reading what you write. And, and they will say, he said this, he said this. They find one word, and they, and they catch that word. They hold fast to that word, and they point out that word that you used that was perhaps a word that you misspoke you didn't intend to do. Well, that's nothing new. That was taking place at that time. And so they're very sharp-eared. They're listening for Christ to say something, anything, 
that they can use as a charge against him. And so verse 14, notice what it says here. It says, when they had come, they said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one. For you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? You see how gentle that is with them? Notice how they approach it. And again, I want to show you some things as we go through this verse and these verses. Notice how they begin. They say to him, teacher. That may not mean anything to us today because the word teacher is used in a variety of ways with different kinds of impact and meaning. The word teacher here in this passage is a Greek word that is translated very often instructor or master. But the word teacher was reserved. It's an honorable word that was reserved for distinguished rabbis. It was, a, it was a word that you didn't say to just anybody. It's a word that you would say to a distinguished person. You would speak to them as a master. You would speak to them as a master instructor. It's a word they're using to speak of his credentials, but it's actually a word that they're using as an attempt to flatter him. And they're beginning this conversation by flattery. What they're appealing to, or they think they're appealing to, is pride and vanity. That's an ancient tactic that is used to capture a person's trust. It says in Proverbs 29, 5, whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. So when somebody walks up to you and says, you know you are the greatest this and that, just take two steps back. Because you never know what they're saying. You never know whether it's true or not, whether they're real sincere or not. And Because it's easy for us to be flattered into perhaps falling into a trap. And they're trying to use that against Jesus. They're trying to use a title of honor against him so that they might be able to draw him in so that they can ask him something as they're about to that may entrap him. And so they say in verse 14, they say, you are true and you teach the way of God in truth. So you're a master teacher and you are true. You care about the things that are true. You are an upright man. You're a man of integrity. You are a true teacher of the word of God. You have a reputation of not adding to or taking away from God's word. That's what they're saying when they say you are true. They're speaking concerning his integrity, the fact that he gives the word of God as it is. You see, that's the characteristic of a genuine teacher. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. That was the mark of a true teacher, to not add to or take away from the word of God. So they're beginning by flattering him. We know that you're true and you care about no one. You don't regard the person of man. You teach the way of God in truth. That was flattery. They don't believe this because if they did believe it, they'd have followed him. They actually thought him to be a false teacher. So they're hoping to flatter him so he'll speak unguardedly. Notice how they go on. They say, you do not regard the person of men. You are not swayed by threats. You're not swayed by argument. You are impartial to all. In Leviticus 19, 15, another Old Testament book, it says, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great. Judge your neighbor fairly. And so they're saying you are Fitting those categories. You are a person of integrity. You teach the word of God in truth. And when they say that, that's another way of saying that you, you, you exude wisdom. You see in Proverbs 24, 23, it says these things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. So not showing partiality in judgment is an attribute of wisdom. You're so committed to truth, you don't concern yourself with popularity. In, in the way it is said in our day at this moment, you're so committed to truth, you're not concerned about being canceled. That's what they're saying. You speak the truth. You're a man of integrity. You're not swayed by personality. You're not swayed by popularity. You're not swayed by any of that. You do not regard the person of men. You'll tell the truth to the lowest, to the highest, and everybody in between. That's something that... That was like the Apostle Paul. 
Paul said it like this in Galatians 1 verse 10. He said, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. You cannot be a servant of Christ and be trying to please man. You have to please God first and foremost. Well, Jesus is demonstrating that to us. These people see something in him. They don't regard it, but they're using the things that people know him for and perhaps even speak of concerning him, and they're saying those things to him. You're a person who doesn't regard the person of men. You speak the truth and all of that. You're not guilty of hypocrisy. And so they buttered him up. That's what's happening here. So after attempting to set him up, they ask their question. Notice the question that they ask of him. Is it lawful? Verse 14, the last portion. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? So there's the question. Is it lawful? Now, when you look at this, is it lawful to pay taxes? As I was preparing this study, one of the commentators was pointing out how many different kinds of taxes Israel had been under during this day. But this particular tax is called a poll tax. It wasn't a tax on goods. It wasn't a tax, uh, a tax on land. It was not a tax on services. It was a tax on them as people. It was levied upon every head of the family, and it had a price of one denarius yearly. The question divided the nation, and this question could have been used against his own men. Remember the men that Jesus had called to himself. Two of the men stand out as I begin to share this. One was a man named Simon the Zealot. You read your Bible, you see the name. Simon the Zealot. The Zealot was not simply that he was enthusiastic. He was a zealot as, as a, a part of, a, of an anti-government group that existed during the time of Christ. The zealots were known to be zealous for um, kill, uh, killing Romans. They were like a group uh, that could have descended into assassins. They were, they were a very, very antagonistic group who were very militant in their hatred for Rome. So you've got a zealot named Simon. But on the other hand, you had a tax gatherer named Matthew. Matthew worked for Rome. How is it that these two, a zealot and a tax gatherer, were able to get together? They did so because they both loved Jesus, and Jesus brought them to loving one another, which is what he does, right? And so what they're doing is they're sowing a seed of discord amongst his men, even as they're asking this kind of question. You see, the tax was hated because the land of Israel belonged to God, not to Rome. And in the tax, they were paying for an invading army to remain in occupation, and they hated it. Hatred for this tax sparked a revolt in, in the year A.D. 6, and it's referred to in the book of Acts. In Acts 5.37, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, drew away many people after him, he also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. In AD 66 through 70, the tax was part of what sparked a major rebellion. The Jews hated this tax. So for the Pharisees, it was a perfect question. The reason for this was easy to understand. You see, if Jesus pays it, he alienates the Jewish population. They reject him. If he says don't, well, he's accused of rebellion. He will be arrested. And later on, you'll see that part of the charges lodged against him was sedition, rebellion against Rome. Now, the Herodians supported the tax. The Pharisees rejected it. But notice verse 15, how it goes on to say something very simply. Jesus said to them, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. Why do you test me? Knowing their hypocrisy, he saw right through them. Again, the proverb says, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Luke 20, verse 23 says this, he perceived their craftiness and said to them, why do you test me? Jesus saw through the question, he discerned their cunning. Their motives behind the question were very obvious. You see, it's very, very foolish trying to trick Jesus. You can't trick him. I was sharing with first service, I've said this before, but perhaps some of you might not remember. 
But I shared how when I was a kid, less than 10, you know, our neighborhood would go out and they would do what we used to call trick-or-treat. So they'd go from place to place, trick-or-treating, begging for candy from neighbors, and that's what we all did. Well, my mom was busting up at the, at the front door one day. You see, my, my dad was a truck driver, and my dad, uh, during Halloween, um, would have deliveries to supermarkets, and he would get these boxes of candy, and they would allow him and the other drivers uh, to take a box home. And they would take that box, and they would give candy to the children who came to the house, uh, you know, for trick-or-treating, this and that. Well, the thing is, is during that day, you know, sometimes you get an orange or an apple. You know, who wants that? And, and, or, you would, or you would get, you know, a box of raisins. Uh, but when they would come to our house, we had, we had the better, during that day, the better candy bars. I don't really eat candy anymore, but at that time, we had Mounds bars, and we had uh, Almond Joys. You know, they were nice. They were good. There were things that I stashed. I would hide in my room. They were good. But the neighborhood kid would come to the house, and they'd see my dad was given these kinds of candies we were given. They, would, they wanted to come back. So my mom was laughing at the door one day, and I went and said, what are you? She goes, David, you've got to see this. She said, there's a little boy. Watch. She opens the door. Well, this little boy had been there three times. He had first come. He was dressed as Dracula. I still remember he black, you know. He had, she said, David, the first time he came, he just held his little bag out, and he said, trick or treat. My mom says, and I dropped some candy in it, and he looked at it. She said, within a minute, less than a minute, I hear trick or treat. My mom says she opened the door and he was standing with his cape <laughs> over his face like that. And my mom had a good sense of humor, so she started busting up. And she, this time she said, watch. She opened the door and the little boy was standing with his hands like claws. <laughs> and he came three times and my mom said, okay, I remember this. Okay, honey, that's enough. You've been here a few times and left. Well, you know what? I've never forgotten that story for this reason. He thought he was getting over on us by trying to disguise himself. But in fact, we could see right through him. That's what the Lord is with us, guys. Never forget that. You might sit there going like this to him, but he sees this, you know. Come, you know. <laughs> he, he sees right through us, man. He really does. And so that's what's taking place here. They're trying to catch him at his words. And so he speaks to them. As it says in Psalm 44, 21, he knows the secrets of the heart. So he says in verse 15, why do you test me? That word test means to entice or entrap. Why do you, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. And Matthew 22, 18 adds the words, why do you test me, you hypocrites, you actors? You see, before answering, he confronts them openly for testing him. You see, this is something their forefathers had been guilty of, testing the Lord. And, and uh, in Psalm 95, verse 9, it says, Your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. They, they put me to the test, though they saw God's work. And he's saying, why are you doing this? It's the same attitude your, your ancestors who rejected God and the law of Moses. It's the same attitude that you're showing to me. And so in verse 16, it says they brought him a denarius. Now, a denarius is a Roman coin. Uh, it was the only one acceptable for the tax. If you looked at a denarius of that day, uh, on one side was the engraving of the emperor, and the other side, it was an engraving of Caesar that was uh, on a throne in priestly robes, acting as a, a high priest. And it was during that time, it was common for emperors to claim divinity. They actually called themselves God's son. But the Jews refused to carry Roman coins because they saw them as idols. So someone is sent to go get the coin and bring it back. So the question is asked, verse 16, whose image and inscription is this? And they answer Caesar's. There's your trap. If he denounces Caesar, they can formulate an accusation against him. But here's his answer in verse 17. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. The wisdom of that answer, well, you're going to see in a moment how they responded to it. 
but he makes it clear. And I want to spend some time looking at this with you, sharing some things that may have some practical application. Hopefully they do for us in the day that we're living in right now. First, it is perfectly legitimate to pay Caesar because the tax was under his domain. Taxes are intended to serve a purpose during that day as well as ours. In our day, taxes are supposed to be used to build roads, to ensure that we have a police force, to order sec uh, security within our society. And the state does receive taxes because taxes lie within the sphere of responsibility of the state. Now, as Christians, this is where we want to get practical. As Christians, we, of all people, should be the best citizens in the nation because Christians understand who is in ultimate control. The one who is in ultimate control isn't our mayors, it isn't our governors, it isn't our president. The one who is in ultimate control, every believer knows, is God himself. And so we know that. We know who is in control, even as Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, that he knew that it's God who puts somebody into the place of rulership. He's the one who does that. So we know that. Now, Paul in Romans 13 in the New Testament in chapter 13 said it like this at verse 1. Paul said, everyone must submit himself to governing authorities. For there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. He goes on in verses 5 through 7. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. In 1 Peter 2, 13 through 15, the apostle Peter said this. He said, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority and uh, every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. He goes on to say, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. And so on the one hand, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In Titus 3, verse 1, it says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. It's something you find in Scripture, both old and new. So the Caesar, the ruling authority, has certain responsibilities and are owed certain forms of honor or respect. So this is where it becomes difficult. In, in elections. You see, we have, we have something that's different than 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, in Israel, they had Roman governors, they had kings, they had, they had different forms of government than we have. We have a form of government that is based on, on different principles. We have a constitution. And, and we know where we derive our rights. We derive our rights not from the the govern, those who were governing us, we derive our rights, and the Constitution acknowledges this. Uh, there are certain inalienable rights, amongst which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We derive them. We are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. So as Americans living in the United States, we know that man did not give us our rights. Our rights come from God. That's in our founding fathers' writings we know that and so no i'm not preaching a political speech so you can settle down somebody is saying please do no we're just going to talk so on the one hand we know we have our rights not from man our rights come from god so what i do when it comes to because we live in a society that or a governmental structure that uh that allows us to vote for those whom we want to have serving in certain offices, then I want to use my vote for good, and I vote according to my conscience. Now, one of the problems I've seen, and, and I'm not going to take a, a, you know, a survey by asking the raising of hands, but 
But not everybody has had the opportunity to travel to other countries. Not everybody, even in this room right now, we're listening to this message, has had the opportunity to go outside of perhaps Canada, maybe Mexico, different countries, but haven't, haven't had a chance to go into other countries. And, and God has been uh, gracious to me, and I have. I've gone into, into Israel, obviously. I've gone into England. They have parliaments. They have different systems. They, they don't have a constitution like we do. They have a different form of government. I've been places where they have a king, where they might have a queen, where they have a different form of government. And here's part of the problem I think that Americans sometimes have, if I may, and, and that is, is that we have a tendency of, of thinking if, if Americans, because we love being Americans, I, I bless God that I am one, um, but sometimes we fail to realize that not everybody has the same culture and understanding that we do. And though that's why Americans, when they travel abroad, sometimes have difficulty because they wonder, they walk up there in Spain, they walk up to Spanish person, and they say to him, do you speak English? And they'll say, no. And then they turn to their, their wife and they'll say, stupid, doesn't even speak English. Well, that's because Americans think everybody should speak English. That's the way we are. You'd be surprised when you go to China. You'd be surprised you go to Thailand. You'd be surprised you go to France. You'd be surprised how many people will not speak to you in your language because they say you're in our country. Why do we have to bend to your will? But we're Americans and we think they should. Now, I'm not saying that's bad, by the way. I'm saying that's being an American. I understand that. I've traveled for a long time. I understand that. I had to learn just because I speak English doesn't mean everybody does. And so I had to learn a long time ago to try and listen to the words or find somebody who could help me to respect them for who they are. But Americans are different. We think everybody should be doing what we do. I say that because it's true. I say that because as a pastor, I've had a chance to travel through the world. I have been in a lot of countries that people haven't been in, may, nev may never go to. And I've seen the attitude. That term, ugly American, is a very real term. It's a very real thing. You know, when 1975, when I was in, in uh, uh, German-speaking countries, some, somebody was being kind of a little bit different, and they looked at me, and they said, do you speak English? And I was looking at them because it, and I was thinking, and so I go, a little. Because <laughs> that's what they do. You who travel know that. Do you speak English? A little. Then after a while, they get comfortable with you, and they may speak fluently. You know, she's American. I'm an American. Do you speak, do you speak English? A little. And so then I helped her. Of course, I helped her. But sometimes, sometimes we don't understand that. Now, this can sound ugly to some people. And I'm trying to be careful how I say it because it's just true. We bring this mentality everywhere and we start thinking that, that everybody ought to think like we do. And part of what it is for me is, is learning to, to think uh, and, and uh, as somebody who's aware that there are differences. And part of it is that we think that because we're Americans, that the, the form of government that we have is the only form of government, when in fact, you can go into North Korea and just for talking about Jesus, you can be put in jail and maybe never let out. You go to India and you can be beaten up in certain places, sometimes tortured and killed because you're speaking something that they don't receive. So for us, like, well, I'm American, I have my rights. You have to be aware that in certain places you may have rights that you have been bestowed on you, but at the same time, there are people who think differently. And I'm saying that to say that sometimes we don't understand what it means to actually live in this constitutional republic that we live in and understand how things work. And because of that, we can get upset that everybody didn't think as we do, when in, in, in reality, we live in a plurality. There are a lot of people with different opinions, and we have to learn to respect their opinions as we try to present ours. I'm saying all of that to say that in, in, in elections, when, when you're looking at somebody who's going to be voted into office, one thing I would say, and I'll say this very briefly, that we need to do is even if we feel that living here in California, there's no chance any of the people that we really support will be elected because in many ways we feel the hopelessness that we've been basically uh, encouraged to feel, I still cast my vote because it's a it's a conscience vote. It's a moral vote. I'm making my voice known. I'm letting people know. You see, there are people who served in the military as I did, but others who served and died for the freedom for me to vote. So I'm going to vote. But a lot of Christians do not. Millions of Christians do not vote. And so we end up with the government we deserve. 
because the Christians have not been voting. So I'm saying that not to pump up one over the other. I'm simply saying that's, that's true. I think we all can agree that's true. A lot of Christians don't vote. We end up, and then we end up saying, see, see, see. And uh, no, it's, it's not that simple. So I'm looking at the, uh, the candidate. And let me, let me kind of share some things. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, unto God the things that are God. So I look at the candidate's view. They want me to vote for them. So I'm not looking at simply the, their positions. I also am aware that their positions can communicate to me something of morality. So where do they stand on subjects that matter to me? Where do they stand on abortion? I want to know. Do they protect the life of the unborn or do they not? Are they opposed to the partial birth abortions that takes place? Listen, some people think that that argument is over. It's not over at all. There are still laws trying to be passed right now that will allow the death of a child after it's part of the womb. They'll let it die. And there are laws right now here in California that people are arguing over. Listen, I have a granddaughter, my olive, Olivia. Olivia was born a month early. When she parted the womb, she was fully formed. You're looking at a, a, a fully formed baby. A lot of times the argument is, well, that's just a blob of tissue. No, my Olivia, our Olivia, fully formed, but not complete. Her lungs were not completely developed. There was still a process that would have taken three to four weeks that she needed to go through. But when she parted the womb, she looked just like any other newborn baby. And a lot of people don't realize that because they've been told that's just a blob of tissue. No, it's not. That is a baby. From the time of conception, that is a baby. That's what that is. And so the idea of of, of terminating her life and, and the argument, and I'm, I don't want to be insensitive. I already made this clear a couple of weeks ago, but the argument is it's my body, my choice. No, your body is not that body. That baby has her own, his own body. It is not your body. It's her body or his body. And so for all these women's rights, you know, they're forgetting that killing, you're killing half the women that would have come into the, the world if the baby was allowed to be born. We can go into that, but I, I look at that. I, I view that, and I think about that. How do you feel about life? How come you 20 years ago said that you were pro-life and now you're not anymore? Why? You want to be voted in? What is it? I actually look at that. Not everybody does. Not everybody does. I do. What else do I look at? Well, how about education? Do you support parents in deciding where their kids will go to school? Where do you stand on curricula? What do you think about parents who get involved in school board meetings? Are they, uh, are they now terrorists? Is that how you look at them now? What right do I as a parent have for my, for my child or as a grandparent to have a voice in the life of my grand? What rights do I have? I look for that. I want to see that. I want to know that. You know, it's interesting, and might as well, I've opened up the door. Might as well take another step in. The um, amen, why not? Yeah, thank you for this half of the church. You guys don't like it? I'll look at you. Uh, <laughs> I'm playing with you. Um, my wife and I were watching TV, and there's an, there's an ad for a new movie. It's Thor something or other. Some of you may be aware of it. I, I, I'm not aware of the, the movie myself, but it's Thor. But it said rated PG-13 parental guidance required. And I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. To go in and see a fictional movie about some pretend thing, a parent has to give permission or accompany that child, PG-13. But my four-year-old can be in preschool. My five-year-old could be in school, and they're going to be taught gender, homosexuality, and things like that. There's something crazy going on that we have to be aware of. You have to be aware of that. They will say that, that you can't buy a pack of cigarettes till you're, what, 18 years old? But you can see pornography when you're five in the classroom. They're actually beginning in some school districts to have pornography handed to children. I, I don't even want to go to it. It's so disgusting, the things that are being done. But I'll tell you this, it's so wrong. And parents have a right to stand up and say, you will not teach my child that. We have that right. Be aware of that. That's all I'm saying. Be aware of that. With the, the issue of homosexuality, where at one time it, it was regarded for what it is, it's something that you're sad that somebody is dealing with and you want to help and encourage them, but you don't normalize it to where it is today. So I want to know where they stand on the homosexual movement. I want to know if they're in favor of homosexual marriages and the things that relate to that. I want to know those things. 
How about um, judges? Is the judge an activist? What, what core uh, values are influencing their judgment? I think we ought to know these things. I think we ought to be aware of these things. We have a Supreme Court justice who's been appointed to the, to the bench now who when asked what is a woman cannot answer that question. That's where we have gotten because I think that we have failed to raise our voice in a way that is right, respectful, but is necessary. We have failed to make our views known and by being silent, the monster has, had given, has been given opportunity to grow and destroy. We need to stand up and speak the truth. We need to be open to do that. We have to be. Because if you don't, who's going to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's? I will pay my tax. I will be a lawful citizen. I will stop at stop signs. Some of you guys got to learn to do that, by the way. That's one of my pet peeves. Going to a shopping mall and watch and see how many people stop at the stops that they have in the mall. They just blow through it all the time. And they're doing it in our neighborhoods now, too. Why? They can't even keep the smallest law. And I expect them to do righteous things. No, I can't. See, we need the Lord to work within us. We need that. So, getting back, I render into Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. But I give to God that which belongs to him. You're not to withhold what belongs to God. You see, the only time we legitimately will reject a law is when it is contrary to the word of God. Acts 5.29 said, we must obey God rather than men. And so when the COVID restrictions and everything came, because as a pastor, I was concerned for our congregation. Well aware of the price that it was going to cost. Well aware of it. Out of love for you guys, those of you who were with us back then, I said, we're going to restrict. We're, we're going to follow the guidelines at this moment because we do, do not know. We, do, we don't know what's going on here. I'm going, to, I'm going to restrict, which we did for a few weeks. But I started getting more information, and I started thinking, I don't, I don't agree with this. I don't believe that this is absolutely correct. And, but Marie, my wife, and I were coming every Sunday. Some of you know, some of you didn't. Most of you don't. But we were coming every Sunday, regardless of whether we were open at the sanctuary for you to, to come in for a Bible study. Why? Because people were rolling into the grounds, and they were in need of ministry. That's what we're here to do. And so when people came in, we had conversations. We were praying with people. Before you know it, people were bringing coffee. You know, people, and, we're, and, and we started having people. Pastor, are you here each week? Yeah, not just me, but there are other staff members. Yeah, we're here. We're here for you. That's what churches are. That's what we're supposed to do. And so they came. And then one day we have a caravan of over 100 people. Well, over 100 people were just coming in with little signs. We love you, Pastor Dave, because they knew I was here. And I saw them. They pulled over, and they came and talked to me. I took them into the chapel. And I said, let's get into the Word. Let's worship. That's what we're supposed to do. And that's what we did. And so I didn't advertise it. I didn't take pictures of myself. I'll show you, Governor. No, we just did it. Why? Because we ought to obey God rather than men. But I don't believe in thumbing my nose at, 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 at government either. So I'm not doing it to be seen by men. I'm not doing it to be recognized. I had a lady who said, oh, there's only one brave pastor in Chino, and that's Pastor Jack. He's a friend of mine, so I'll, I'll use his name. Pastor Jack Hibbs, he's the brave one. Well, that's not why you do what you do. What you do is to honor God, not to be seen by men. And when people, wrote, I wrote her, and I said, listen, darling, we've been meeting now for weeks. I'm just not putting it on social media. It's, it's because we're not doing it to be seen. We're doing it to, to honor him and to care for those that God entrusts. And, that, and that's not a knock on Jack. He's a friend of mine. That's not a knock on him. He did what he did, but I do what we do. Why? For you and for him. I wanted to protect you. That's why we did it. That's why. I waited and I thought. And I still to this day, you know, if somebody wants to wear a mask, God bless you. Too. I don't understand a lot of it when you're driving in your car and all the windows are rolled up and you've got two masks. I'm kind of like saying, come on, stop tripping. <laughs> I see people walk in their dogs with masks and put the, I've seen dogs with masks on them. <laughs> anyway, getting back to it, what we, what we, what we need to do is we render the proper respect to our government, but we reserve our worship to our God. 
In Malachi 1, 6 through 8, a son honors his father, a servant his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due to me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due to me, saith the Lord Almighty? It is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You place defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled and diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? You see, the, the Pharisees didn't want to give Caesar his due, but they also did not desire to give to God what was due to him because they refused to honor God when they refused to honor his son. In John 5, 23, it reads it this way, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Well, when he spoke this way and he put things in the way they're supposed to be in the proper perspective, it says they marveled, they left him, they went their way. Luke 20, verse 26 says they were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. Astonished by his answer, they became silent. You see, they thought they had trapped him, but it was he who trapped them. In Job 5, 12, and 13, he thwarts the plans of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are swept away. Again, Proverbs 26, 27, if you set a trap for others, you will get caught in it yourself. If you roll a boulder down on others, it will crush you instead. And that's what took place here. They set the trap, but they were caught themselves. Honor God. Honor government. But reserve your worship for God himself. And when it comes down to it, we ought to obey God rather than man. So, if somebody would have come up and said, we're going to put the pastor in jail for holding church services at my church, I'd have said, John, you're now the pastor, <laughs> and I'll visit you every once in a while. I'm just kidding. Father, we bless you, and we thank you.